Hi, and welcome back to my videos for General Chemistry 2. Today I want to tell you more about intermolecular forces, especially about an application where those forces are especially important, and it's an application that might surprise you. Intermolecular forces are an important consideration when we're trying to repair or restore artwork, especially paintings. You might recall that in the last video, we talked about four intermolecular forces, ion-dipole forces, hydrogen bonds, dipole-dipole forces, and London dispersion. The last three of those are sometimes also called van der Waals forces, because it was Johannes van der Waals who realized how important they are in determining the behavior of gases. You might remember that when we talked about gas laws in general chemistry 1, we saw that van der Waals was very interested in the attractions between molecules, and he used his discoveries to develop an equation for gases that's more accurate than the ideal gas law. If you've forgotten about that, you might want to look at video 38 from the General Chemistry 1 course, where we talked about van der Waals. Anyway, the van der Waals forces tell us that two polar molecules will attract one another because of dipole-dipole interactions, and two nonpolar molecules will also attract each other, this time because of London dispersion. We can use that to our advantage when we want to preserve old or damaged works of art. For example, here's a before and after image of a painting that's been restored. You can see cracking in the old image, but in the new image the colors are brighter and the cracking has disappeared. How did they fix that? The secret has to do with intermolecular forces. The cracking you see isn't actually the paint or the canvas. When an artist finishes a painting like this, sometimes they'll coat it with a layer of varnish. This protects the painting from drying out and from bits of dust and debris that might damage it. But unfortunately, many varnishes themselves will dry out eventually, and when they do, the varnish shrinks and cracks, just like wet clay cracks as it dries out. That's the source of the damage you see in the old image. Also, lots of old types of varnish turn yellow with age, and that's why the colors in the first image seem duller than in the later image. So, part of the repair of this painting was to take off the old dry varnish. We do that using a solvent, something that can dissolve another substance like the varnish. So what kind of solvent should we use? It depends on what the varnish is made of. The intermolecular forces tell us that if the varnish molecules are dipoles, then the solvent should also be a dipole in order to attract it and help it dissolve. On the other hand, if the varnish is nonpolar, then the solvent should also be nonpolar, so that London dispersion will cause the two molecules to attract each other. From our discussion in the last video, we know that London dispersion is the weakest of the intermolecular forces, but dissolving the varnish will still work if we're patient. So, is varnish polar or nonpolar? The answer is, it depends. Both polar and nonpolar varnishes exist. For example, one type of varnish has linseed oil as a main ingredient, while another type has the compound damarine as a primary ingredient. You can see that neither of these molecules is completely symmetric. Actually, very few large molecules are 100% symmetric, so neither of these molecules is completely nonpolar. However, you can see that the linseed oil has several oxygen atoms in it, and these are very electronegative, and they also have unshared electron pairs on them. Meanwhile, damarine contains only carbon and hydrogen atoms, and those two elements have very similar electronegativities. This makes damarine less polar than linseed oil, so a nonpolar solvent will probably be more effective in removing damarine than linseed oil. So, if we have a fairly nonpolar varnish, we should pick a nonpolar solvent and take off the varnish with that, right? Well, maybe not. Remember, underneath the varnish is the painting, and we want to keep that looking beautiful. We don't want our solvent to take off the paint. So that means we also need to know whether the paint is polar or not. There are hundreds of different paints, and some, like indigo, are fairly nonpolar while others, like cobalt violet, are very polar. Since a painting will have many different paints on it, one painting could have both polar and nonpolar paints right next to each other. 
So we have to be very careful in choosing a solvent. We need to remove the varnish, but not the paint underneath. That means we might have to use different solvents on different parts of the painting, depending on what paint is underneath the varnish. In many cases, the painting is so old that we might not know what the paint's made of. That was the case when the frescoes on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel were restored. In that case, the conservators had to guess what solvent to use. They'd find a tiny corner of the painting they were working on that wasn't easy to see from the ground, and mark out a grid on it with chalk. In each square of the grid, they'd try a different solvent until they found one that had just the right polarity to clean the painting without damaging the paint. As you can see, art conservation requires a fairly in-depth understanding of chemistry, and that's why art conservators take plenty of science courses as part of their training, in addition to learning lots about art and art history. We mentioned in the last video that it's the intermolecular forces that cause gas molecules to attract each other and become a liquid as the temperature drops. When a substance changes phases like this, it's a physical change, not a chemical reaction. Even so, we can write a reaction equation for it as though it were a chemical reaction. For example, when we change water from a liquid to a gas, we could write a reaction like this. Remember, we can write the phase in parentheses next to the compound. The reason we might do that is because a phase change like this will either give off or absorb heat, and we can determine the heat and use it to do lots of useful things. For example, this reaction has an enthalpy of 40.67 kilojoules per mole. You might remember that when delta H is positive, that means the process absorbs heat. That makes sense for this reaction. We have to add heat to the water in order to turn it into a gas. Here's another example. In this case, we're melting solid cesium into a liquid. The enthalpy for this reaction is 2.09 kilojoules per mole. Again, this is a positive number, because the cesium has to absorb heat in order to melt. In fact, we can write an equation for any phase change. We can start with a solid, liquid, or a gas, and change the phase to any of the others, and each of those changes will have its own reaction and its own enthalpy. How do we change the phase? Well, one way you already know about. We can raise or lower the temperature. Another way would be to change the pressure. We can summarize how the temperature and pressure can change the phase of a substance using what's called a phase diagram. A phase diagram is just a graph with the pressure on one axis and the temperature on the other. We draw lines showing the areas where the compound can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas. So, for example, suppose this pressure is one atmosphere and we start at a low temperature where the substance is a solid. If we raise the temperature but don't change the pressure, that means we go to the right on this graph. Eventually, we hit the dividing line, and when that happens, the substance becomes a liquid, so that's the melting point. Remember, when this happens, we're performing a kind of reaction, and the phase change has an enthalpy. As we saw before, if this substance were cesium, changing it from a solid to a liquid would take 2.09 kilojoules per mole. Notice that if we were lowering the temperature, we'd be freezing the substance instead of melting it, and the enthalpy would have the opposite sign. If it were cesium, the enthalpy change would now be negative 2.09 kilojoules per mole. Also notice that if the pressure were higher or lower, the melting point would be different. For example, if we were at two atmospheres, you can see that the melting point for this substance would be higher. There are two other things to notice about phase diagrams. First, there's always one point on the graph where the solid, liquid, and gas phases all meet. If the pressure and temperature are exactly the ones at that point, then all three phases will exist at the same time. For example, you know that at zero degrees Celsius, you can have liquid water and solid water in the same glass. That's just ice water. But you don't have water vapor in that case. However, if you got the pressure and temperature just right, you could have all three phases. 
That spot on the phase diagram is called the triple point. Also, notice that the line separating the liquid and gas phases stops at a very high pressure and temperature. That's because if we get the pressure high enough, a gas becomes so thick that it's not possible to distinguish between a gas and a liquid anymore. They become basically identical. The place where that happens is called the critical point, and the temperature and pressure at that point are called the critical temperature and the critical pressure. We'll work with phase diagrams a bit more in class. One last thing to know about phases is that each type of phase change has its own name, which you should be familiar with. You already know some of these. For example, you know that changing from a solid to a liquid is called melting, and from a liquid to a solid is called freezing. Changing from a gas to a liquid is called condensation. You're familiar with that from the condensation you get when water vapor in the air becomes a liquid on your cold drink on a humid day. Meanwhile, changing from a liquid to a gas is called vaporization. Notice that it's not called boiling. That's because it's possible to change a liquid to a gas without boiling it. You've seen that plenty of times before when the water in your sink or spilled on a countertop evaporates. The liquid vaporized, it turned into a gas, but it didn't have to boil in order to do so. The last two phase changes are probably the least familiar to you. A solid can turn directly into a gas without ever becoming a liquid. That's called sublimation. There are two places where you've probably seen this. One is with dry ice. Dry ice is solid carbon dioxide, and when it gets warm, it goes into the gas phase directly without becoming a liquid. The other example you've probably seen is in solid air fresheners. The solid in the air freshener becomes a gas, which is what you can smell without it ever becoming a liquid. And the last phase change occurs when a gas becomes a solid, which is called deposition. This is the one that you usually see the least. We can do it in a lab, though. For example, here's an experiment where we have iodine vapor, which is the purple gas in the beaker. The flask above it is very cold, so the iodine changes phase from a gas to a solid, which sticks to the glass on the bottom of the flask. The gas to solid phase change is called deposition because the solid gets deposited on the surface of the flask. Well, that's all for now. When we talk again, we'll see what else we can do now that we know about phases. It turns out that we can use what we learned today to find out a lot more about heat and energy. I hope you'll join me for that in the next video. Until then, have a good week.